The year was 1924, and the city, Chicago. On the evening of May 8th, in Heine Jacobs' speakeasy on South Wabash, an event unfolded which would become all too common in the Windy City. Ragtime Joe Howard, an independent hijacker, was drinking, probably too heavily, and he began to boast of how easy it was to hijack beer trucks. And he said to his friends, especially the ones owned by that greaser, Torio. Ragtime Joe was a gangster from another era. A hard-fisted brawler, he didn't carry a gun. It wasn't necessary. Brass knuckles to the jaw is good enough, he quipped, and them wop beer boys will fold up like an old newspaper. As he and his friends were lapping it up, Joe noticed Jake Greasy Thumb Gusick, the financial wizard of the Torrio Capone gang, sauntering out of the bar. Ragtime Joe got up and hurried to the door, cutting him off from leaving. Here is one of those WAP workers, he said loudly, and then slapped Gusick across his face. And then for good measure, he offered a couple of well-placed kicks to his shin. Gusick was a small man. He wasn't muscle. And he had no choice but to stand there and take the abuse. Finally, Ragtime Joe grew tired of abusing Gusick and returned to his seat laughing. Gusick promptly left the bar, and even though the hour was late, he didn't head home. He went straight to his friend and sponsor, Al Scarface Capone. An hour had passed when suddenly Capone walked into the bar. Ragtime Joe, who seemed to have a change of heart towards Italian bootleggers, got up to greet him. With a grin on his face, he stuck out his hand and affably said, Hello, Al. But Capone wasn't there to make friends. He grabbed Ragtime Joe by his collar and yelled, Why did you kick Jake around, Joe? Howard, now with a half grin on his face, became indignant at being manhandled in front of his friends. And so he tried to play the tough guy. Aw, oh, go back to your girls, you dago pimp, he said with a tone of disgust. But Capone was in no mood. He pulled a pistol out from under his coat and emptied all six rounds into Ragtime Joe's head. Joe's lifeless body fell to the ground. Capone then casually sauntered out of the saloon. The three witnesses still in the bar at that late hour stared silently in amazement. Heine Jacobs, the owner of the establishment, and two customers, George Bilton and David Runnelsbeck, looked down at the body of Ragtime Joe. There was blood everywhere, and Joe still had that grin on his face. When police arrived, the three witnesses swore that the killer was Al Capone. The next day, the Chicago Tribune, for the first time, published a photo which would, over the next decade, become all too familiar to the citizens of Chicago and would become synonymous with the city's underworld. The picture was that of Al Capone. Though police were looking for Big Al, he went on the lam. It was a month before Capone would stroll in to the Cottage Avenue station and say to the officer on duty, I hear the police are looking for me. What for? Capone was immediately hustled into the criminal courts building and interrogated by a young state attorney, William H. McSwiggan. You killed Joseph Howard, he charged, and we've got witnesses. Who, me? Capone responded with both sarcasm and unbelief. Why, I'm a respectable businessman running a second-hand furniture store. Who? No, I don't know anyone named Torio. Anyway, I was out of town the day this fellow was killed. You had better speak to my attorney. As the investigation continued, the witnesses to the murder became forgetful. Bilton took leave of Chicago and never came back. Runnelsbeck's identification of the killer became sketchy. That may be him, but I'm not sure. It was awfully dark in there. And Heine Jacobs, Ragtime Joe's friend, he now claimed that he was at the other end of the bar and really didn't see what happened. The coroner's jury at Joe Howard's inquest handed down what was to become an all-too-familiar verdict. Joseph Howard, 
also known as Ragtime Joe, came to his death at the hand or hands of one or more unknown white males. A little less than two years later, McSwiggan, the state's attorney who had interrogated Capone, was hanging out with friends, West Side gangsters James Doherty and Tom Duffy, when they were gunned down by what was reported to be a heavy set man wielding a Thompson machine gun. All three men were dead on the spot. At the time, witnesses stated that the shooter was Al Capone. But during the investigation, the witnesses again became forgetful. And like many before and after, this charge was also dismissed. <laughs>